Music Law, part two of our double header with Erin Jacobson, the music lawyer. This is Anyone Can Play Guitar, the podcast for musicians and music lovers that takes you behind the scenes of the music industry. This week is brought to you in partnership with MGR Music. Ever wanted to learn an instrument, hone your skills, or pick up something completely new? You can get so far by yourself, however, professional guidance can make all the difference. With a network of tutors right across the UK, and rates starting from as little as £15 per hour, visit mgrmusic.com now to get started. Hello and welcome to episode... 58, which is the second half of a two-parter on the music roll, with me, Ben, and him, James, and Ding Ding. So we're still in Newcastle, as you were in the interview. Yes. And Erin is still in the somewhat sunnier climate of Los Angeles, US of A, which would be very nice. Yeah. Um, last week with Erin, we discussed, or you did, copyright. I did. Music composition and royalties. Very important. Oh, very important. You know, using that one riff would probably not be considered infringement, but that's just because that's happened over time, not because, oh, it's okay to use those three notes or, you know, that chord progression. Today, we move on to the equally important topics Mm -hmm. of contracts, publishing, and record deals. Erin covered her important disclaimer at the start of the last episode, which was the start of our conversation. Uh, However, I wanted to add it back in uh, to this one because we've chopped the episode in two, just in case people aren't listening to these episodes in sequence. So that uh, Erin's absolutely necessary and very valid disclaimer is uh, up front for this episode as well. Right. Okay, so before I directly answer that question, I just have to give a little disclaimer about the information that I'm going to share. No problem. Uh, Firstly, it's not legal advice. It's just for informational purposes. These are the disclaimers I have to give as an attorney. Um, It does not, the information that I'm giving today does not create an attorney-client relationship between me and anyone listening to the podcast If you do have a legal issue, please seek an attorney in your area for advice. And if anything I say is considered advertisement, it's just general in nature, not directed towards any specific person. And also, as you and I spoke about offline when we were scheduling this, is that I am based in the United States. I'm licensed in California. So anything that I talk about is going to be from that perspective, but it might differ based on where you are. So I know you, you know, you're in Newcastle, (laughs) I'm I'm in Los Angeles. So it's, um, you know, the, the UK laws are a little bit different than US laws and um, you know, even within the U.S., we have some state variances based on contracts sometimes, even though copyright is throughout the U.S. Um, overall. Remember, a great way to support the show is to go on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and give us a rating and a review. It really does make a massive difference for the show. Now, on with the episode. <laughs> Do all our introductions last week. Let's get cracking, James. We finished off last week's episode on royalties, and we're going to pick up a conversation now on contracts. Okay, so moving on from royalties onto contracts. So, contracts. Yeah. So what? Very what yeah. Well, I, I, as with all of this, I, I think. Yeah. But uh, so so yeah. So what what's some of the most common types of of contracts and the various scenarios? Right. So. My theory is you need a contract whenever you are doing business with someone else and in the music business that usually the most common scenarios are either you're collaborating with somebody else or 
you're working, somebody's bringing you in to work on their music, you're bringing somebody in to work on your music, or you're signing with a company for, for your music. So it could be that you're writing a song with somebody else. It could be that you're working with a producer and it could be you're even just hiring some musicians to play on your record. And it could be you're signing with a record label or music publisher. So all of these situations, you're, there's somebody else involved besides you. And this can even be within a band as well, because there's different people involved. There's, you need to know who, who's owning this music, how the people involved can exercise their rights. Do they have any rights to exercise or are they just really a hired person and they don't have any rights to it? And who is getting paid and what are they getting paid and how are they getting paid? So those are kind of the, the main hmm. aspects, the most important aspects of the contract. But of course, there's other things that go into them as well. But it's, it's very important because so many times I see where people have not done a contract and then there's a dispute later about who owns the music or what the splits are on the song or somebody's not getting paid and they thought they were supposed to be getting paid. And it just, it happens all the time, every single day. <laughs> it happens. I, I can imagine the, the classic example will be there's one person in the band who's written the music and the lyrics and everything and there's a number of other people in the band who play the component parts but then everyone thought it was going to be an equal share and right <laughs> yes and then and then the one that wrote it is going no i have all the publishing because i wrote it and yeah it's definitely a very common way that it happens but there's also other ways that it happens as well it's just it's so prevalent and i imagine that there's a, a great way to uh split up the band on day one almost i mean that must be yeah. quite a, a, an awkward conversation to get into for a lot of people right well it's you know it's tricky because a lot of times bands don't have those conversations and so like the example that you just gave is going to come a year into it when they finally release the album and and a little money starts coming in and then the band's in a terrible argument and potentially breaking up because nobody talked about this to begin with. Whereas it is awkward to bring it up in the beginning, but it's actually the best practice because if you can't agree on it, then <laughs> it's probably a sign that maybe you don't want to be in a band with these people because working with them is going to be difficult. And if somebody in the band doesn't want to talk about it or you know you see a whole different side of them and they become incredibly difficult i mean really i would advise thinking twice about being in a band with that person because it's probably not going to get any better and yeah at least you know if you if you're able to work that all out in the beginning then everybody's clear on what the expectations are and everyone's on the same page with that there's no surprises later yeah, and I imagine it's far less emotional a conversation as well than when there isn't right. a, an album exactly. out or a, a lot of money coming in. Right, and in the beginning, everybody still is excited about working together theoretically. So I think people are more motivated to work things out, whereas by the end of it, they might not even be talking to each other. And I've had situations like that where band members were really at risk of losing everything that they'd put into this band for the last few years because they didn't talk about it in the beginning and now they weren't talking at all and they didn't have money for lawyers to help work it out or anything so it can be bad yeah no i think that's a a, a great point in terms of having that conversation at early yeah. doors yeah yeah even in the beginning when you're if you're just even if you're not in a band but you're a solo artist and you're maybe co-writing a song with somebody else it's really important because 
you need to agree on the ownership shares of that song. And if everybody's handling their own share, how that's going to work. If you're working with a producer, whether as a band or a solo artist, producers sometimes can have ownership of a recording. They get royalties, there's fees involved. So again, you, you want this stuff worked out in the beginning, not later when you're kind of stuck in a in a bad situation yeah right so moving on from contracts uh publishing yeah oh, right one of my favorite parts right of the business. i love publishing excellent well uh, much like all of the other topics you know what's the different types of publishing agreements then how do they differ what, what do our artists need to think about when it comes to publishing right, right. so if you're signing with a music publishing company, I mean, first always know who you're signing with and whether it's a reputable company, because not all of them are, but the ones that are, are, you know, can really be fabulous. I know a lot of really great publishers and I love working with them. How would someone be able to distinguish um, if someone's, you know, they don't really know that part of the industry, they can obviously go on on the internet and do some searches, but what, what, what would give it an indication of one a, a publishing company being reputable or, or otherwise? Right. So, yes, I mean, I would say the first step would be look on the internet and see who else is signed to that company. They usually list a, a good portion of who their writers are. So if you're signed or if you know that you've heard their name around, you know they're more of a, a well-known company, you're probably in a better position. If you've never heard of them, you're going to want to do a bit more digging as to what they've done. And, um, but also in this case, again, you're going to be signing a contract in this situation. You want to have an attorney or a solicitor, if you're in the UK, reviewing this contract and negotiating it for you. And you want to have someone that's experienced with the music industry and music contracts. So generally that person will also be able to help you to know whether this company is reputable or it's a new company that no one's ever heard of. But you can also talk to uh, you know, your, your musician colleagues um, or if you have a manager or something, have you ever heard of this person? Um, because it is important because I've definitely seen where people have signed with companies that are, it's not that they didn't know that they were reputable, but maybe it was like their manager's publishing company or their producer that they were working with, or, you know, some company that nobody had heard of, but they had promised them a lot of wonderful things. And then it ends up not being a good situation. And then they want to get out of the deal and they can't. But if you're with one of the bigger companies, it's usually fine. But again, it has to be the right partner. Even if it's a reputable company, it might not be the right partner for you. So you have to look at it from that aspect as well. But as far as the types of agreements that will get signed, um, there's a few different ones. So the first one, which isn't being used quite as much, it was definitely more common 50 years ago, 30 years ago. It's called songwriter agreement. It's basically where the writer transfers 100% of their copyright ownership to the publisher. And then the income is split 50-50 between the writer and the publisher. So that's kind of the, the old traditional way of doing things, which still happens, just not as commonly. The next type of agreement is called a co-publishing agreement, where the writer will transfer 50% of their copyright ownership to the publisher. And then the income will be split 75% to the writer and 25% to the publisher. Okay. And the next type is called an administration agreement. And that is where the writer does not transfer any copyright to the publisher. And the Percentages tend to range from about 10 to 20, 25% to the publisher and then the rest to the, to the writer. There's also sub-publishing agreements, which usually as an independent artist, you might not be doing unless you've really been getting a lot of attention on your own. 
Um, a sub-publishing agreement is usually when a publisher signs agreements with publishers in other territories. And that way there's someone in that other country to be minding the music and managing things and getting opportunities. For, so for example, a publisher in the US or the UK might sign a deal with a publisher in France to handle the French territory. Yeah, that's just one example. I mean, it really, it kind of depends because some of the larger companies have offices in other areas. And so maybe you're signing a deal for all of Europe um, or you're signing a worldwide deal with one company, but that company has agreements in place with other companies around the world or they have worldwide offices. So it's basically kind of getting a network together. So you're you actually have people in these different territories. But again, for, for independent, especially just starting out, that's not really gonna come into play as much. The other type of agreement I, I do wanna bring up, even though it's not a traditional publishing deal, but I'm seeing them a lot lately. So people will sign with libraries, music libraries or placement houses where they're basically companies that pitch the music for placements and film and TV. But these agreements have started to look more like publishing deals because these types of companies, even though they're not really traditionally music publishers and they don't necessarily furnish all the services that a, that a real music publisher would, they've seen the value in owning catalog from other people and accumulating copyrights so they have these kind of different scenarios where either they become the administrator of your work initially or if they get a placement of your work then they become the administrator and then at which point you have to transfer copyright ownership and there you know there's different levels of how they trigger this but they're not traditional publishing deals and they may or may not be be advantageous to to the writer so i get a lot of writers that will say to me oh i got offered a publishing deal or a co-publishing deal and then i look at it and i say no this is a placement deal where they're trying to turn it into a co-publishing deal and a lot of those companies there's a lot of them that have cropped up and they're not all reputable and a lot of times people sign with them and then never hear from them again so those are ones that you definitely want to be careful with but all of these deals you want to have them reviewed it's in most of these cases you're giving up ownership and even if you're not you're tied with this company for a certain period of time which is usually a few years and if it's not a good situation it could be detrimental to your career so again have it reviewed know what you're signing <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah <laughs> Um, uh, this this sounds like almost a, I don't know if this is a fair comment, but a, a sort of risk versus reward type scenario. If you when I was listening, you go through the the various different types from a, a songwriter agreement at the top, where there's a hundred percent sign up sign over of, of copyright, right down to the the admin agreement where there's nothing. There's it it intrinsically feels like there's less risk the less of my copyright that I give out, but then the amount of money that I stand to make is less is it is there more to it to think about or is that a way of looking at it well in the administration agreement you're the writer is still getting the majority of the income on that but in in any of these situations you do have to look at risk versus reward because it, and it also depends on what deal what type of deal is available to you at that time because as a brand new writer you're not going to have, you know, you're, you're going to have more risk really because you don't have the bargaining power to, to negotiate a better deal. Even if you have a good lawyer, you just, you, you still might, might not be able to, to do that. And then as you get more famous, the more people want you. So they're willing to make you a better deal or take less ownership or whatever the situation is, give you more money because you're already more famous at that point and they want to have you on their roster you know the rolling stones can pick whatever deal they want to do whereas a new band doesn't 
doesn't have the power to do that. And don't, don't sign a deal just because you're getting offered a deal. You know, you want to make sure that's actually a good deal for you to sign. But I do have these conversations a lot where, especially in the beginning, you do have to give up something in order to get the benefit of what the deal is going to offer you. But you also have to make sure that as much as you can, that the deal should be offering you something, especially in those library deals. A lot of the times it's no upfront money. And if you do have to transfer ownership to them, it's for very little money, sometimes no money or sometimes very little money, and it might not be worth it. So again, it's a case by case basis that you have to look at and say, does this make sense? So when it comes to the, the publishing deals and the length of them. Um, typically, how long will these deals range from? And at the end of those deals, if you have given over ownership, what happens to that ownership at, at the end of the deal? So again, it depends on the deal. Um, usually, these deals are probably going to start out somewhere around three years, something like that, and then renew either for Option periods, maybe of the same length, or maybe it'll be annual renewals, you know, one year automatic renewal each year, something like that. Depends what it is and who you're negotiating with. When you're transferring copyright ownership, it's usually for the length of copyright. So there, there's a word that we see a lot that says perpetuity which basically means forever. So it's usually for that. Sometimes there are reversions based on the deal, but it really depends again on who you are and what's being negotiated. And I'd say those are not as common. Right, okay. Well, and, and I guess it comes down to each one being being different um, in your, your right. own personal circumstances. Right. So, I mean, for example, for a co-pub deal, if you've transferred half of your copyright ownership, when that deal is over after the three years or whatever it is, the publisher will stop managing your share of it, that 50% that you've kept, but they will still be able to keep their 50% ownership. So now you become co-owners with this company. Right. Okay. And could either of those parties, what could they do with that ownership? going forward right so going forward the the part that you've retained as a writer you can sign that with a new company maybe an administration deal or uh, you can self administer it which ad administration is basically managing it collecting the royalties doing the licenses that that sort of thing but that publisher will with their 50 percent ownership they'll still be able to manage that share of it um, so for any licenses that come in, you know, both parties will have to consent to the license, for example. Right. Um, when income comes in, it, that will still be split 50-50. So, yeah, I mean, it's still that person is, is now your, I guess it's like when you get divorced and you have uh, joint custody of the kids, I guess, right. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> I guess that's sort of a. Okay, no, that, that makes sense. Yeah, there, yeah. Would it get, would there ever get to a point where somebody maybe's had, I don't know, a majority stakehold in, uh, in a copyright and other people having less? And mm -hmm. would it then be the majority stakeholder can do what they want? Or does everyone who has a stake need to be involved in, in any future agreements? Right. So going forward, the way that we do it is that for non-exclusive licenses under U.S. copyright law, technically one person can do a non-exclusive license as long as they make sure that everybody gets paid. So like if they're collecting the money, they have to pay the shares to everybody else right. pursuant to their ownership percentages. But in practice, that's really not how we do it. So again, like if a license came in, the the person that wants to license that music would go to every owner to get permission because they don't want any of those owners coming back and saying, well, you never asked me or I never got paid for that. Because a lot of times actually with co-writers, it's like after they write the song, they don't even talk to each other half the time or 
the companies that own those shares don't communicate with each other. So it becomes very fractured, I guess. Yeah, I I, I can, I bet. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Again, it gets complicated. (laughs) Yeah, well, that's why the likes of your good self uh, do what you do, I guess. This week is brought to you in partnership with MGR Music. Ever wanted to learn an instrument, hone your skills, or pick up something completely new? You can get so far by yourself, however professional guidance can make all the difference. With a network of tutors right across the UK, and rates starting from as little as £15 per hour, visit mgrmusic.com now to get started. Last week we heard from Erin who gave a very personal good cause message relating to the Neuroendocrine Tumour Research Foundation and the fund she set up in memory of her mum. Remember the charity are currently matching any donations made via her fundraising page so check out the link in the show notes on our website. This week we've got more good causes from Erin that she's really passionate about. Another charity I like to support is called Girls Love Mail and it is a charity that distributes letters written by volunteers to women who are undergoing breast cancer treatment and the letters are messages of support and encouragement for these women going through treatment to help keep them positive and so they don't feel so alone and it's a really great way to also connect with someone that is going through something that you may never meet or you may never see them, but you're positively impacting their life in some way. If you're an animal person, a charity that I really like is the Sheldrick Trust, who is very big in wildlife conservation efforts, and the Sheldrick Trust rescues and takes care of orphaned elephants, rhinos, and other animals in Africa, and they take care of them until they are old enough and ready to be reintegrated back into the wild, and for animals that cannot be reintegrated back into the wild, then they give them a forever home, and they do a lot of other wildlife conservation efforts and they have mobile units that help to provide medical care for animals out in the wild. So they do a lot of good things as well. And I just believe in helping people. So any charity that focuses on education and empowerment for young women and girls, charities that feed the homeless, provide clean water to people, just help people and make their lives better is a good one. As ever, you'll find more links in the show notes on our website. So now, back to the episode. Back to music low now, and we're about to move on to the record deal. We've spoke about record deals before, James, but this is a bit more of a... um, This is definitely a behind-the-scenes look. Oh, yes. So, as we said in the last episode, or you did, how many musicians have been fleeced by a record label over the years? Lots and lots. And this is when the law comes into play once again. Okay, well, the last of the main topics that we wanted to cover, I think, was record deals. So, the the deal used to be the big utopia, the the goal, the, the main target for everyone. That's shifting a little bit these days, but I guess, you know, if... If a label or a, a big record company does come knocking, w- what should our artists be thinking about? Right. Well, again, is this label the right partner? Because a lot of times, especially now, like you said, it used to be the utopia. It used to be that was everybody's goal to get the deal with the major record company. And now because of the internet, there's a lot of people that are doing quite well on their own and they're making a living off their music. So a label is not always the right choice for everyone at this point. And I think it's important to think of if if you do want to partner with the label, who is the right label or is the, the person offering you this deal the right label? Because again, it's, 
you're going to have to give up something when signing with that label. So if you're doing well on your own and you're keeping all of the money for yourself and then you're signing with the label, you're going to, they're going to be keeping a majority of the money from now on. And then you're going to get a percentage of that money and is what they're offering in exchange for that worth it? You know, is the, is the financial backing and the connections and the promotion of this label going to take you to a new level in your career where it's going to be worth it? Or is it actually potentially going to stunt your progress as an artist? Because I've seen both things happen. And the other thing is, is are you better off signing with an independent label or a major label? Kind of depends on who you are as an artist and what kind of music you make. And then, of course, a lot of that will come down to the actual terms of the contract as well. But, um, you know, it's always both. It's not just about what's on the piece of paper, but it's also not just about do we like these people or not. It It has to be both. Yeah. Uh, I, and I can imagine for a lot of people, it would just be so tempting to just jump at yeah. the chance and say, yes, yes, definitely. Right. I've got a deal. Right. Brilliant. So right. I, I think that that's good counsel in terms of the, the various things to to give thought to. Yeah. And, and also another thing is now record deals don't just deal with records necessarily. In, in many cases, they, they want publishing, they want uh, merchandising they want a percentage of touring income um, sometimes the, if you branch out into other areas like you're a musician but then you get a part as an actor or something um, you know they want a piece of that too so really think about what you're mm, signing scope of well the deal mm. yeah yeah mm. exactly okay right I mean there's a hell of a lot there to, to think yeah. about for, for, for listeners. <laughs> which... I know, I just let you ponder that for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. So just quickly, I guess, in, in sort of reviewing all of those things that we've just spoke about, Erin, what, what's the the main things that you constantly see musicians getting tripped up on? What, what What's some of the, the common right. sort of, you know, gotchas and things to watch out? Yeah, well, I mean... Again, it is sort of a summary of what we talked about. I mean, going back, it's, you know, not registering with the the proper organizations to make sure that your royalties are collected and not making sure that those registrations are correct. Because a lot of times there's people that they are registered with the right organizations, but the registrations themselves are not correct (laughs) with the, the correct song information. So then they still don't get paid. So that's, that's a big thing that happens a lot. So knowing where to register and making sure you're properly registered, making sure you have all your documentation correct and have a record of it. And then going on to the the contracts that we discussed before, having those conversations and deciding the ownership splits and the income splits and having that in writing. So if there's ever dispute later, you can produce that piece of paper and say, no, look, this is what we agreed on. Because again, these things happen all the time, especially with the songwriter split agreements, the producer agreements, the band agreements, Uh, people are signing work for hire agreements and not understanding what they mean, things like that. And then beyond that, if you're signing a deal with you know with a, a more established company and even if you're not if you're signing a deal with anyone really you know have your attorney or your solicitor review that and don't be afraid to ask questions and explain that to you and if your representative is one of those people that just goes oh you don't need to know I'll handle it that might not be the right person for you because my view is at the end of the day it's your career you have to know what you're signing and you should be able to ask your attorney or solicitor questions. They should be able to explain it to you in a way that you understand it. And you, you should feel like you can trust this person and they're looking out for your best interest. And unfortunately, I see a lot of times where people don't feel that way and they come to me and they say, well, I had this other attorney before, but I never felt like I could ask him questions or I didn't feel like he or she explained it to me properly or they didn't even explain the deal to me at all. And they just told me that to go sign it. And 
I, I don't feel that that's the way that it should be. So I always explain things to my clients. I answer all their questions. I encourage them to read it and then come back to me with questions before they sign it, those types of things. Mm -hmm. So again, I mean, education, you really, you know, even though you don't need to be an expert on every little detail of the industry, you need to at least have a general idea of what you're signing. Because again, at the at the end of the day, it's your career, and you're the one that's going to face the consequences if you've signed a bad deal. Yeah, and, and it's a complicated subject, right? So I don't think anyone should be frightened or ashamed to just not understand things right. and, and want to ask more. Yeah, it's incredibly, I mean, I think as we've just barely covered today, <laughs> it's, it's incredibly complicated. And no, you don't need to feel ashamed. And on the converse, you don't need to act like you know everything when you mm -hmm. don't. And, you know, there are resources to educate yourself as well. But th the thing is, is that while you should have an understanding, it's also not your main job. I went to law school to know how to do all this. So with my clients, their job is to create music. And while I want them to understand what they're signing and what kind of agreements they're entering into, their main job is still to be creating music. Whereas my job is to be understanding and explaining all of these business and legal things so that they're protected. And so it becomes a collaboration. But if you as an artist is doing all the creation and all the promotion and all the business and doing all the contracts, there's not going to be that much time for making the music. It's just, it's too much. So your trusted advisors are there to help you achieve your goals, to be on your team and help you succeed, but just have an idea at least. Yeah, no, well said, well said. And and speaking of, of resources, so I know you have your indie artist resource. Do you want to give a, listeners a, a quick sure. sort of pitch on, on what that is? Sure. So that is uh, separate from my law practice where I, you know, see clients and draft things specifically for client situations. But I noticed that there were a lot of independent artists, songwriters, producers, etc., that they were just starting out and they were just not at that level where they could hire an, an attorney. They just weren't, um, either they couldn't afford it or maybe they were afraid because they'd never worked with one before or you know, whatever the situation was. I just felt like, how can I also help this subset of, of artists? And so what I did is I drafted a bunch of contract templates, which are the most commonly needed agreements for independent artists, writers, producers, and they're based off of the contracts and the language in the contracts that I use in my actual legal practice. But, you know, they're templates, so they are a bit more general. They're not going to cover every single little scenario, but I know that they're good and they're high quality and they're affordable and it's so it's a, it's an affordable diy solution where you're still getting a high quality contract as opposed to going and downloading some free template you found somewhere on the internet which may or may not be what you need and may or may not be any good and believe me i've seen many many mm -hmm. templates that are not good and i can tell immediately when somebody sends me a contract from someone that doesn't really know what they're doing and I can tell they've taken three different templates that they found for free online and copy and pasted them together. <laughs> it's, it's just a mess. So yeah, so, the, so my website, Indie Artist Resource, which is IndieArtistResource.com, offers these most commonly needed contract templates for independent artists and then also some educational resources as well so there's some videos and uh, audio lectures and stuff that explain a lot of the stuff that you know we've talked about today I'm, I'm working on getting some new things up there as well but uh, the songwriter split agreements are up there there's producer agreements band agreements work for hire master ownership there, there's a whole there's a whole list of different things. So, so for someone that's not able to 
hire an attorney or a solicitor. It's um, it's a good resource. Although it is, it's mostly U.S. based. So if you're in another country, you still want to check with the laws in in your own country. And then also, even within the U.S., they're they're all based on California law because that's where I'm licensed. So there are disclaimers and whatnot if you're not in California. Yeah, well, so. it, it sounds like it, it provides a great service and plugs a, a potential gap between the, the two sort of extremes that you, you've described. So uh, we'll, we'll put links in the show notes to, to your website to, to point listeners in, in that direction. No, thank you. Yeah, I'm happy. And, and that was the goal really is to, to help all musicians and artists and writers, not just the ones that have already achieve fame and fortune (laughs) and and, you know but if anybody does want to contact me uh, directly or hire me through my practice or whatnot um, my own website is themusicindustrylawyer.com brilliant so there's stuff about me and there's a, a contact link and everything through that as well well, look, Aaron, it's been absolutely fantastic having you on the show. So just a big, massive thank you and hopefully speak to you soon. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. And, you know, anytime you want to talk about more music legal stuff, uh, you know, happy to do so. So that concludes our two-part delve into music law. I feel like I've learned something, man. I definitely have. It just shows how complicated a world it can be and how important the likes of Erin mm-hmm. really are. Thanks again to Erin for our time. I really think this is going to be a massively useful um, episode for I listeners. Agree. As ever, get in touch if you've got any thoughts and, uh, and comments. Yeah, totally agree. If one person just happens to listen to it and it saves their bacon, then brilliant. It's done, its, done its job. So that's the last of our episodes on specific topics for season two. Unbelievably, that's so quick. Mm. So whilst you've heard the conversations with Erin in full, as promised, we are now starting to release each interview with all our guests in their entirety. And so in the coming weeks, that's what you're going to get. Before we do, though, next week, we're going to cleanse the palate, as you keep telling me. Uh, 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 yes. <laughs> like a little uh, lemon sorbet. Oh, <laughs> I know it's sorbet, but I like saying sorbet. You do, yes, that's <laughs> a fact. Um, so we're going to have a little bit of a montage next week of uh, so a new thing I introduced on the fly in one episode. Yeah, when you started asking well, the musicians yeah. that we've interviewed. Quick fire questions! <laughs> yeah. Now, disclaimer, question two to five are normally very quick. Question one is rarely quick. <laughs> yeah. And that's nothing to do with the guests. It's definitely the question I've asked. I just haven't thought about it fully. Question followed by quick fire questions. <laughs> yeah. It's a brilliant question. And I love the answers that pretty much everyone gives. But it's not quick. <laughs> mm. To give you an idea of what's going on, here's We Are Scientists. Our first gig you ever went to? Uh, now also sort of courtesy of my older sister, uh, it was Bon Jovi mm-hmm. with Skid Row. Wow. It was pretty good. It was the Miami Arena. As a reminder, if you like the show, please, please take a few seconds just to give us a rating and a review wherever you get your podcasts from. It makes a huge difference in helping us grow our audience and promoting the show. All of the show notes for today's episode can be found at acpgmusic.com along with our back catalogue of episodes. If you like what you hear, or perhaps have some improvements or specific guests you'd like us to consider, we'd love to hear from you. Email us at info at acpgmusic.com or hit us up on social media. Keep supporting upcoming artists, and we'll catch you next time.